Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Welcome to our Wednesday night broadcast. And we welcome you, welcome you once, twice, thrice. We welcome you to another courageous discussion tonight, as he said and she said, as we want to focus our attention on uh, our need to communicate on family matters. And uh, these are the things you never knew the things you never knew and so and 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 this, the things you never knew is probably the things we just never talked about um together but we each have a story and so we have a panel of individuals who we will be sharing with and discussing some issues that i think um is apropos to the season that we're in but before we do that let me tell all of our Bethel members that um i got a, connected today um with the family of our, our minister of Vinya hines and uh, so unfortunately we were made aware that she is um, um, preparing to transition. She is down in North Carolina with her, her daughter, Shakima. Many of you might remember her from many years back. I took her down there a couple of months ago and, um, and, and she had been increasingly ill. Um, this is a reoccurrence of a past um, illness that she had. It's come back, it's come back with a vengeance. And, uh, and for the most part, she said she had gone into a non-responsive state but we talked for a bit tonight, and then I asked her to let me talk and pray with Albania, which we did. And, and, and she said, she's with you, she's with you. She was responding as we prayed. She told me she's hearing you, she's hearing you, and I'll be able to, to minister to her and then to pray with her. And, uh, but the doctors expect that it will be any, any time now. So we want to keep her in prayer. She's worked in the Sunday School Department for so long faithful, faithful, faithful member of the church and um, been a minister among us for a long time. We had, um, had the opportunity to officialize it uh, recently and so we're glad we did that and she was very proud of that moment. So we want to keep that family in prayer as well as those of you who are on the line, whatever you're dealing with this day. We had a wonderful prayer time at six o'clock in the morning. And we challenged uh, our people from out of the word of God and um, I, I believe it was heard, it resonated in terms of the posture that we had to take in a time when we're going through our own conditions, our own heart conditions, because of memories and what has been repressed and trauma and just the reality of what now everyone is 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 speaking about, talking about. And we'll talk about to what degree in just a moment. But um, but if you're on this uh, streaming today, bow your heads with me as we just go and, and take all the needs to prayer. And Lord, we come at this time. Thank you for your loving kindness, your tender mercy. Come, thank you for your goodness, O oh God, to us in the land of the living. Thank you, Lord, for wisdom and understanding, O oh God. Thank you for breaking through our darkness and our ignorance to show us a light that is hard to perceive in the natural, but in the supernatural, we can see it. But at the same time, Lord, we recognize that even as we see it in, in the spiritual, there's a natural application that we are required to apply as the house of God, that justice should roll down. And so, Lord, we are believing you to continue to speak into our hearts, our minds in this time of, of sheltering in, in this time of, of a different uh, pace, a different lifestyle it, where we're very sensitive to all kinds of stimuli. We're very sensitive to the season that we're living in at a time when a lot of those who are sleeping are waking up to some harsh realities. And Lord, at a time when they're, where the, the public debate is being held and staged and 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 key questions are being asked to those powers that be, and that we would make those necessary adjustments that we will see it through and may the church lead the charge. Lord, we pray for your people, therefore, we pray for where we're at in our own lives, our own walks, our own circumstances, where we are challenged, where we are, are, are sick in spirit, where we are hurting, Lord Jesus, that you would apply the balm and Gilead that makes a wound of spirit whole that you will reach down now, Lord, even in the situation in North Carolina, and that represents so many others who have loved ones who are sick. Some are preparing to transition and dealing with it under the conditions in New York City that we are in. Lord, we ask perhaps other areas to able to relax and do it a little different, but here we're still, Lord, confined. And so we are believing you, oh God, to give us what we stand in need of in a time of sorrow where we can't, Lord, necessarily grieve on the level that we want to express ourselves on the level that we want to, oh God. But yet, Lord, again, there's that bomb in Gilead, that reality of the healing touch that comes from above. 
Lord, we pray for the hearts and we pray for the minds. Lord, I pray for a spirit of reconciliation, oh God, where there is walls that have been built up and because of varying attitudes and ideas and perceptions. Lord, may we stop building walls and build bridges, Lord, and come across and, and help our brother and help our sister and bring life instead of death, Lord Jesus. And life and death is in the power of the tongue. And too many of us, Lord, speak, Lord, words of ill instead of words of blessing. And so, Lord, I pray that there will be a different mindset as we have been praying for unity in the body. We're praying for a clarity of thought and execution according to divine standards, oh God. Not my will, but thy will be done should be the cry in every heart. Not just how I think it should be, but Lord, what would you have us to do? And Lord, may we be adjustable, Lord, in our perspective and also the application of what you have blessed us to do, what you have placed in our hands. May be done all to the honor and glory of God. Lord, now for this uh, group of men and women, Lord, that have gathered, Lord, may our conversation be pleasing in your hearing. May we speak, Lord, as oracles of the faith and may, Lord Jesus, your name be honored and glorified in all that we say and do. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, praise God, everybody, and, and we want to get right to it. Um, we want to um, invite um, all of our panelists to, to just come on board. And what we're going to do is, um, as we talk about he said, she said, the things you never knew, we're going to introduce them one at a time. And um, in int introducing them, uh, we're going to ask them basically to ask this question. Everybody's got a story. All of us have a story. Well, give us your best shot. Give us your best story as we get into this thing about what's happening and, you know, uh, in terms of race, in terms of um, misconception, in terms of being a woman of color, man of color, you know, what your experience, what is gripping your heart in this season? And I'm going to start with our brother, Sean White. God bless you. Just introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your background, each of you, as you come on so folk can know who you are and, and then tell us, tell us what's on your heart. Well, greetings, Bethel, and greetings. Okay. Facebook and Instagram and everyone who may be watching right now. Um, I am a licensed social worker. I've been doing it for more than five years and I work in an elementary school. And prior to that, I've always worked ever since I can remember, I would say since I was in high school, I worked helping young people and helping people just find their way. So I definitely feel like that's my calling, that's my ministry. Um, what's on my heart right now is just sadness, but hope at the same time. And, you know, I, I appreciate this opportunity to be here with you guys and share and be real and to start to talk about difficult things and have these conversations and also recognize that I am a, a man. I'm a man of color. I am a believer. But at the end of the day, we can't say that we don't see color, we don't see race. I, I think that that's a, a fallacy. I think that we really have to recognize what makes us unique and make us different, but then come together um, as one, as one in the body of Christ and just, you know, to be a, that model, like Bishop was talking about, so that we can help all of us because we're all affected. So thank Amen. you. Thank you, Sean, and welcome. Uh, I see a little more over here, amen. <laughs> I see. I see you with the beard gang too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but yours is black. Yours is black. Mine's not. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, Chris, you can keep holding your chin because we're going up to Leah. Leah Lattimore. Hello, Introduce everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation to be with you all. My name is Leah Lattimore. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, but I've been in New York for 20 years. So I guess I think I might have residency now. Maybe. Um, so I have a very long title um, at New York University where I'm employed. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Inclusive Global Student Leadership and Engagement, as well as the Director for the Center for Multicultural Education and Programs. Um, and my responsibility is to think about how we create a more inclusive campus for our students. Um, and so this is really timely. It has me thinking about how do we sustain momentum? How do we move strategically? Um, how do we work together in community? I was just on a forum um, with a group of students just continuing to have these conversations. So, I mean, I think it's certainly devastating some of the things that we're seeing coming out of COVID and um, certainly the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, but something feels different. 
something feels different about this. And so I think this is a really important moment and um, there's a great opportunity that's coming on the other side of this. All right, thank you so much, Leah. Now we go to the King. Chris King, introduce yourself, tell us your heart. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Christian King. Um, I am a host, comedian, uh, actor, singer, uh, and worship leader. Um, there is a lot going on right now. And uh, from what I'm seeing, there's so many uh, distractions from you know, my peers, uh, social media, um, you know, where I do a lot of my work. And it's been uh, for me sort of difficult to uh, perform if anything, or, or or to be able to do that with everything that's going on. Um, I really feel like now is the time where I am uh, utilizing my platform to, and I, I feel like I've had, I've done this before, but never on this level, um, using my platform to um, hopefully educate, um, inspire people to speak up and, um, you know, br really bring awareness um, as, some people uh, tend to act as if they're not aware, but you know, bring awareness to a lot that's going on. So that's just me. Thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing more of your thoughts. And finally, we have Pastor Zelda Washington. Hi everyone in Facebook land and YouTube. Um, as the great bishop just said, I'm Pastor Zelda. Um, I'm past, uh, one of the pastors at uh, Bethel Gospel Assembly. I am also a principal in a charter school in that great borough of Brooklyn. Uh, Bushwickison Charter School is my school and I work with the K through four students. And um, my job or my task is really to drive student achievement through the adult that I am tasked to fill up. And so, I'm very committed to that. It is a very trying time. It's always a very trying time in education. And people ask you, um, how are you doing right now? I'm not okay, but to whom much is given, much is required. And so when you're giving the seat and the privilege of leadership, it's your responsibility to handle the gift well. And so I've been trying to really navigate this privilege and the seat that I sit in amidst everything else that's going on. I hope to be very transparent and as real with you as possible, um, that even as a pastor, I can tell you like, I am not okay, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so that's how I take my next steps. That's how I operate because I know that God is with me. And so even though it doesn't look good, God is with me and he's with you as well. And so that's where I'm at in this state. Now we're gonna get deeper into this conversation of gender. So the question you posed Bishop was, can you repose that question? Well, what I want to know, in fact, let's do it this way. We can flow right in and thank you for all of you, really. Um, you all are educators, communicators, and you have, and you're shapers of lives, and that's incredible and important. And we know that there's a lot of discussion now on a national, international level. We're talking about uh, defunding police departments, talking about um, uh, the, the lynchings that have been taking place. In, and, and, and folk are now dealing with it. Some of them from the heart, some of them maybe not so. But the fact is, we are dealing with it on a national level. While we're dealing with all that on, on an international level, the point is you're still people of color, you still have a certain gender, and we want to talk about the gender biases. So what we'll do is change that first question a little bit, Pastor Selden, and just ask you, and start with you, because you brought up some things. And what do you think is the biggest misconception about life for women of color in America today? <laughs> the biggest. So I'm going to use biggest as operative word, right? I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that we're loud, we're angry. And the flip side of that would be that people assume that we're okay because we represent or we show up and we're strong or it looks strong, but in the inside, the misconception is that we are okay. And sometimes you have to stand up and you have to speak up because somebody else does it, right? And so I think that misconception uh, continues to be perpetuated in the church as well as in the marketplace. Um, 
because they see us more than they see a lot of our brothers out there. Mm -hmm. Leah's Lee nodding in agreement. You want to add to that? I wish you could see my notepad because that's <laughs> exactly. And I even went to a number two and you, and you, can you hit the number two with the number one on the biggest? So I think we're in agreement. Absolutely. I think, you know, that we're aggressive. I think it, it's conversations that impact the way that we're able to show up. So if I'm going to disagree with someone in a meeting, I have to think of what's my tone going to be? How am I going to frame this? Mm. How am I going to show up? Because if I just come at it, um, all of those tropes, angry, bitter, all of that comes up. And I think particularly, Pastor, you hit it on the head with, you know, that we're strong, which sets up our inability to get the support and the help that we need. Because then if you don't demonstrate strength, oh, you're weak, you maybe can't handle it. Should you be in that role? There are plenty of women who are doing that and bearing that and managing that. And why, what's wrong with you? Or what's, oh, I don't understand. And it's like, well, there, there's, there should be no shame around saying, I need help. I need therapy. I need support. I can't do this. Just saying no. But because there's been this model of what strength looks like for women of color and particularly Black women, if you are anything less than that, you are less than as a woman of color. Well said. Um, let me throw a word in for you guys. Intimidation. Intimidating. How does that word grab you? Um, I would say it's very, woman. it's as a black woman, it's very typical, right? Um, that your strength is seen as something intimidated. As a matter of fact, you are always given this language that you need to speak so that you can be heard. And even in that, it's offensive. While I understand the intellectual um, uh, concept of speaking so you can be heard, it's another way for us to be told, don't show up in a very powerful uh, or opinionated way, tailor it back. So don't let your passion come out. You gotta tailor that a bit so that they can actually hear you. Okay. All right, now, now Leah's in agreement. So let me move a little further on this. So naturally, you're in NYU, and you've been around the world. You've been in China. You've been all over. And and of course, Zelda, you're you, you you're the principal of a powerful school in Brooklyn, as well as this fantastic preacher. And that's the way I want to go with this. So surely, we're talking about you know, in in those places, higher halls of learning, and and out in the world, that's where you have a issue. But certainly, when you come to the church, there's no None of this really applies, right? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I know we're called to be in the world, but not of the world, but we bring that our ills into the church, right? And so um, something very typical, like if, if your brother is saying, surely that couldn't exist in the church. You know, I think as a female pastor, I've been told many of times that you preach like a man. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what, you know, I know what they mean by that. But, you know, it's supposed to be a compliment when you say that you preach like a man or, you know, what? oh, it's not that big of a deal. Well, you women, you can handle that part, you know. Um, and I also think that we've just become very lazy with the text, right? The theological understandings, the, the hermeneutics around how the role of women in the text. And so we're either demonized or they lift up the, the women that struggled in the text. Of, well, not Mary. You know, Mary's the pious one. Everybody wants us to be about Mary. But we don't talk about the Priscilla's of the Bible who really showed uh, Paul the way, right? We don't we don't talk about those women that gathered around him that helped him to launch the church. And so I, I, I would say that in my experience, and there have been many a times as a woman, I've been invited to churches. They asked me to preach on the floor, not from mm -hmm. the pulpit. They asked me to take off my earrings, to take off my hat. They asked me, they try to be, police your attire. So, and I'm not saying everyone, so I'm painting with a broad stroke right now, a broad paintbrush, it's not everyone, but it is very real and it's very evident. Um, even in meetings, you know, the good old boys club, You, if you ever step back as men, I want you to sit back sometimes and notice how many times the men talk versus how much the women talk and who's leading the meeting. And I'm also of this mindset, it's not us, them, it's us and, right? We, we, we pitted ourselves against each other, but it should be 
the men and or the women and and not necessarily the men versus, but that's the way it plays out. And we're going to be honest. And, and Leah, let me put the question this way to you. Um, your background, your education, your articulation, you know, all of that, um, you know, is, is, is right there. But let me ask you, as, as someone who's not ordained in, in that sense, have you, how did you feel, did you feel that your gift things that you bring into the church have been consecrated unto the Lord? Did you feel like I have a voice, I, I, I need and I can make a meaningful uh, contribution to this work? Did you feel that way? And that's why we're talking straight. And I know on the past <laughs> the church that you're in, but go ahead, talk to me. <laughs> I, I mean, back, so if anyone comes after you, sell the I, guy. You know, <laughs> um, I think yes, but I think there were times where I am happy to not be ordained, right? And so <laughs> just to reaffirm what my sis said um, over there, but I think, so I think, I think what's interesting is how dynamics are set up in the church that don't necessarily allow you to bring all of that into the space where I have a, you know, I have all the titles and the degrees and all the stuff. And then I come in and I say, I think maybe we should, you know, maybe we could shift this over here. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and, and, and put that in the comment box. And, and we'll see. It's like, no, 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 I'm telling you because I, you know, I, I oversee a center and this is something that we, you're doing right, you know, but then how long have you been walking with the Lord? Oh, no, but I think in a face, you know, so there's a little bit of that that happens um, and certainly looking for the validation of other voices. And I think that there's also, if we can, we're going to be, you know, real talk. I think there's even in the ways that we interact with each other. Right. So there are moments where I come into the church and have to be mindful that, you know, a hug is a hug might be interpreted differently for me. Um, being playful might now result in a in a gossip chain. Um, what I'm wearing could be a part of a new conversation in ways that certainly exist outside in the workspace. But I'm way more aware of my identity, particularly as a woman coming into the church space um, and interactions with people, how I show up, what I say, how I say it, then I would be outside. Mm -hmm. That's 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 deep. That's deep. I want to see if we can get back to that. <laughs> but um, I want to remind everybody that you can leave questions in the comment se uh, section. Doesn't guarantee that we'll use it, but you can put it there and if we if, if someone flashes something at me and say, this is a good one now, we'll, we'll throw it in there. And uh, so we're looking for you to just participate. So get on that chat and we can chat it up and then we'll try to include you in our discussion. And um, we're going to ask the gentleman on the line. Um, now, now we know, I want you to answer both questions, both in the, in the community as black men, and I'll, I'll word it for you, but also in the church is, is and I want, I want you to be able to answer it this way, so remember this one. Um, how, how liberating is it as a black man, to, especially dealing with what we deal with outside when you come to the church? How, how liberating do you think, it, do you feel it is? And how liberating do you think it is for most of the brothers? Uh, and, I have, and I want to see how you answer that, then I'll ask, ask you a question as to, or explain why I asked it that way. But here's the general question. What do you think is the biggest misconception about life for black men in America today? Christopher, uh, Christian. Um, is that uh, we don't have a plan. Uh, a, a lot of time, well, for me, I know uh, in what I'm doing and everything that I have going on, um, there is a lot of misconception that uh, I'm, okay, for instance, with all the chaos going on, with all the, everything that's happening right now, what I've been hearing is, okay, what now? You know, what? Okay, what? What do we do after this? Or what happened? What are? What's going on in play after this? And I feel like a lot of the people who um, are asking these questions are concerned because of the lack of, you know, uh, and and it's not just it's not it's sometimes it's it's fellow men. Most of the time, it's fellow men who are asking, "Okay, so so what's your plan for this, or what's your plan for that?" 
you know, um, what happens after all of this is said and done, what are we going to do now? And I think that's an important question to ask. Um, but it's almost, and this is, this could be different for anybody else, but for me personally, um, it's been that we have no plan and all of this is for nothing. Our, our, our protesting, our, our marching, you know, it's all that we we're just going to go right back to, to what we were doing initially. And it's hard to fight that because there are, there are sometimes, you know, you run across things, um, that seem inevitable. And, uh, it's almost as if, it's almost as if, you know, I have to fight. Sometimes I feel like I have to fight my brother in the fight for my brother. So that's that's been that's been a thing for me. So so what I'm I'm hearing you say is is a misconception of, of perhaps um how connected we are in terms of, of we have it together collectively and corporately, we have this plan, we all we're all on the same level, instead of understanding that we're different individuals who are hurting on different levels and are in need of that support. And and the question is, is is are we as tight as we should be? Are, are we, we as tight as we should be? Each other as we should be? Is that, I think I'm hearing that from you. Or are we as tight as we should be? Are we as really connected? Are we really about this movement like we say we are? Are we really uh, for the cause? And, and uh, how long is the cause gonna last until we go back to doing, uh, or, or, or not we go back to doing, but uh, the depiction of us, the previous depiction of us, it, it goes right back to to the the status quo. I mean, you you what you're saying resonates because um, we have our own community um, action um, initiatives going on, a number of them. And, and what I've been speaking to our people as we're going to those meetings is all right, and the, and they're, and we're all over in a lot of meetings. But one of the things I bring out says, as as I hear some of them, I attend some of them, I get the report back, and. We'll, they're going, and I, I can call some credible meetings, some credible people sitting around the table, but it's going around in a circle. It's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm talking about legislators. I'm talking about uh, uh, leading police uh, hierarchy. Um, I'm talking about, um, and they're looking. And so they're, they're saying, all right, now you have created space for us to have this dialogue. And so we understand this should not have happened. We understand these are, but now, Tell us, articulate for us. And one of the, uh, one of the ministers of the church was talking to me about one of the shows on Fox News and how they had uh, Cornell West and another individual. And, and these people are supposed to articulate and come together, but instead on Fox News. And so instead of us coming together, see right to your point and talking in a manner that says, this is direction. And you know, you got a Cornell West and you got something going on. But he's not able to talk because he's defending himself from his own brother. Right. And so, so right. these kinds of things, and and I don't want to rain on on your thunder, Sean. No, no. This. <laughs> However, you want to jump in on this, and then I'll also invite the ladies to just kind of comment as well. Go ahead. All I'm going to say is, boy, we are unpacking some issues tonight. Um, I love it um, because I think this is how change starts. You know, having these uncomfortable conversations, but. Um, I, I want to piggyback on something that Pastor Zelda talked about as far as the things that she's dealt with and Leah talked about as far as in the workforce and also at church. A mm -hmm. lot of this, from what I'm hearing, is microaggressions and implicit bias. Come on now. <laughs> and it's just basically as far as the things that are said in and out of the church that offend people, and you may not even be aware of it due to your implicit bias because these are things that are ingrained from as a child and it affects all of us. So let's just be real. It's not a black or white thing. We all are affected by these implicit bias. So I just wanted just to touch base on that um, and how important it is for us to, to be mindful of that. And to once we realize that we can change our thoughts and we can change our actions. But to answer your question, Bishop, I think that one of the biggest misconceptions about men is that we don't take responsibility for our lives, that we do not work, you know, we don't go to school. We don't take care of our families and our communities. And I think that many people think that black men are criminals. We're lazy. You know, we don't want, we want to take the easy way out and we don't care about others. 
And they also think that we're aggressive and we're violent. And I personally know of many men, and we all can probably agree to this, that you know, in and out of the church that are caring, loving, hardworking men that just want what's best for themselves and their families. And I definitely need to say this because it's important since I'm on this panel to say that any person who knows me knows that like my mother is like my heart. She's my confidant. She's my friend. She's my hero. So that personally offends me when I hear things being said about black men. And I understand there's a, there's a historical context in reference to slavery and families was being separated um, you know, once they came to this country. And even as far as when you look at public assistance and how uh, monetary benefits was given to families when the, the, the husband or the father wasn't in the home. So I understand that that isn't something that just is a coincidence, in my opinion. But I think that that is something that we, 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 we combat this every day as Bethel. You know, there's a lot of good brothers, you know, that I've been fortunate enough to speak with and, and, and fellowship with. And um, I'm just thankful that we are changing that narrative. Thank you for that. Um, we, we've heard some of what the, the sisters said. Um, how, what would you say as, as men in terms of, of the receptivity to, to uh, and I think you were touching on that just now a little bit. What would you say to men about a woman's place? You know, everybody's got a mother, but it's like you can treat anybody else the way you want, but don't treat my mother this way. But yet, whoa, wait, but everybody's, you know, these are women too. And so why is your mother exempt? Why aren't all given the same respect and level of respect? What would you say to them as men um, in terms of how they should, um, what would you say to other men actually about how they should regard your sisters, their sisters? Um, I would say that if the way a man views his mother says a lot about how they treat even other women. Um, so I've so I've experienced um, to say to another guy that, you know, oh, well, this is my mother. She's she's different from everybody else. You know, um, I think when we look at mother, we look at nurturer, like you said, confidant, best friend. Um, I feel like everyone, every woman has the ability to be a nurturer. Uh, you know, it, not what we're going to say, like, oh, well, that's just your role. That's you know, that's what you do. But sometimes it's, it's just in, it's just in you, you know, um, for me, I wouldn't want, if I know that you have the ability to be a mother or a, a aunt or a godmother or whoever, you know, you are, you're not just anybody especially for us in this community. You're not just anybody now. Now you're, you're somebody who was very valuable on any level, whether I know you or not. The respect that I have for my mother, my mother was once a young woman in this community. My mother was once where another female stands. Why can't I show another female, another woman, the same respect I show my mother? You know, what about that respect extending to the fact that, hey, you kind of know math better than I do. Why can't you be the treasurer of the church instead of me? Or, well, you you have a business background in communications. Why can't you know, maybe you need to have this role mm -hmm. instead of, of a man. How about that level of respect? So the, the same the same level where, where Leah says, you know, a lot of her, a lot of when she makes suggestions and when she makes comments, mm -hmm. it's always placed on the back burner. Or it's always, oh yeah, put that in the comment box. That we can probably save that for later, you know. Um, it almost you 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 take away the value. Mm -hmm. You take away the value of 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 the gem that you have. Yeah. And, and and let me ask Sean, why do we you know, you're the sociologist here? Tell us why why do we do that to our women? <sighs> Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just writing notes, just like Leah. Like, I'm just like, oh gosh, I got to write this down, write this down. Um, I wanted to write something that just hit my spirit as far as, at the end of the day, we have to, and I've been guilty of this, as I'm going to be transparent as far as putting people on pedestals for titles, you know, and you have to recognize that the church is a hospital, in my opinion. It's like mm -hmm. there's a little bit of everyone who's dealing with different issues and, 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 and they're just trying to be their best selves. And I think that whether it's tradition, whether it's just, you know, focus on, well, I've been in the church longer, you know, whether it's, um, you know, you don't know this person, but I do, 
uh, I think that that has a lot to do with it. And if we're honest with each other, I think that, and I'm Bishop, you've preached about this numerous times. You know, if we're honest with each other, I think that we have to discuss it and change it because if we can't take care of our own house, how do you think that looks when we have visitors, people coming from other countries and not even just other countries, but down the block or other boroughs, you know, I think that that definitely says a lot and no church is perfect. And I have to say, like, I love Bethel and, you know, I see the good work that Bethel does every day, but at the end of the day, you know, we got to strive to be better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ladies, listening to the, to this discussion, I want to ask, ask you this, how does this, how does the mindset of men in the church and the powers that be that want to limit the expression of, of our gifted and talented women that should be respected as, as Chris and Sean said across the board uh, should be respected uh, for all what they have the capacity to do. But then beyond even just that nurturing element, the fact that there is brilliance. And so the fact that, that there is this sense of holding you back, how does that create a issue among women in how they relate to each other especially for those that seem to break through the glass ceiling and achieve a certain uh, level of, of, of authority within the body. How does that, what happens among the ranks of women? Mm. Zelda? I was, I was trying to be nice, Leah. Uh, so far, um, so far. So it goes to this whole notion again that um, hurt people affect hurt people. Some of the biggest offenses that I have received or that are received by other women, particularly in the church, have come from women, right? Because I think it's a mindset. I also want to say that there's healing even in the dissonance. So I appreciate when people are yeah. honest and upfront about where they are, because that's the only way we can move forward. So the same way that you guys were talking about, you know, just as brothers, sometimes you're not on the same page, but you, you want the same outcome. Sometimes that happened for women too. And how, you know, do you, there are the negative Nancy's when God is promoting you. And, and that's why you gotta be, you know, you don't put your trust in man. You gotta just put your trust in God because when God promotes you, you can stand in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the naysayers, whether you're in the marketplace, whether you're in the church. I think it's uh, I believe uh, Ben Franklin said something to the fact that justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are so outraged that uh, as the ones that are affected. And so that is so important, right? For those people that don't experience that, that feeling, we need you to be outraged in the way in which women are being treated or even, you know, gender to gender, how we treat each other. Right. And, it, and we won't see change until the one that sits in the corner and say, well, that doesn't really you know, matter to me. We won't see change until you speak up, until that person speaks up and say, listen, that's not right. Let's come to the table. Let's have a discussion about it. But I, you know, in church, you know, church folks, I'm not talking about y'all out there. I'm just talking about real church folks. We are afraid of leaning in. And that hinders our growth. I really believe that when you push, you push because you love someone. When you push, you push because you're invested in the cause. And what I mean by push is, you know, some people have, call them difficult conversations. I call them crucial conversations because they need to be said in order for us to move forward. And one of the things I teach, whether I'm in church or in the marketplace, a push is not unkind. It's probably the best thing that we could do for each other is push each other to be even better. So I would say we need to have the ones that are silent speak up so that we could have real discussion and not just lie and say, I'm okay. You're not okay. You're not okay with the way that that sister's hating on you. You're not. Woman to woman, let's have a real talk. Let's not be catty about it. Let's let's have real talk. Like you need to take several seats. You need to step back a little bit and give me room to step up. And when God opens the door for me, it doesn't mean that he closes it for you. His doors are big, right? So all the doors can be open for all of us. And we gotta be cognizant of not shutting the door on each other because you wanna be on the platform. It ain't God if you wanna be on the platform anyway. But that's my two cents. Go ahead, Leah, take it home. No, Sean wants to jump in. I see him. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, actually, I do. <laughs> I do. Just because I just was going to say, and I don't know if I answered your question, Bishop, but I'm going to answer it now as far as I think that the, why, the reason that that happens in, in church is that people are afraid. They're afraid. 
They're afraid of losing their title, their position, or what they think that they might have accrued, which is exactly what Pastor Zelda said, that at the end of the day, God gave that to you. So no one can take that from you. But they are afraid, they're intimidated by uh, people for whatever reason. Um, and I think that that's why that happens in church. That's and, what I was going to say. And so that was, that was great, both of you. That's good. So Leah, let's let's adjust a little bit. So can you talk from the vantage point of someone who has achieved, broke through the glass ceiling, they're in there, and now looking back at others who are left in the lurch or left in that valley wanting to climb up, is there is there a projection that comes from those who, quote unquote, made it, a sense of entitlement that creates a schism with the rest of the body even if it's not about them getting a particular title, but maybe joining with the voices of silent that would say, be silent, joining with the men, some of the men who say, you don't really have anything to say, though, though you get to be a part of this, but, but you know your place. But now do you join and keep them suppressed or do you encourage them to strive? Is there that sense of, 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 of conflict between those two classes? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, something that we sometimes forget is the same oppressive systems and frameworks that we experience mm -hmm. outside of church can show up in the church. So the same sexism, the same elitism, the same classism, all of that still shows up here. You know, hopefully there's transformation, you know, in the Lord and, you know, Pastor Zelda will give you a beautiful sermon around that. And, but, the reality is that it, it happens. And you have some people, I think Sean was saying it earlier, who are more concerned about losing that thing that they got mm -hmm. that wasn't actually theirs to hold, mm -hmm. right? That, that that the Lord appointed you and could easily remove you. We could think through all of those, you know, stories of folks who, you know, the, 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 the kings who fell from, from, from grace and from, um, from authority because they didn't listen. And because the higher up that they got, they they rose in the ladder or ascended into leadership, the further they pushed away from folks who were on the ground in the spaces and started creating these arbitrary steps on the ladder, right? So there might have been something that I did that facilitated my success and my growth. I have to share that information with somebody mm. else. It may not work for you, and that's fine. But I can't hold the secret sauce just you know, to myself, <laughs> you know? So, you know, those who would say, teach, guide, promote, shift the spotlight, you've got your title. So you, you, you've arrived, you made it. Okay, great. So now I'm going to use my platform and shine a light on somebody else who I know is coming up behind me who has something to say. And for whatever reason, hasn't been appointed, hasn't been anointed, hasn't been promoted, hasn't been all those things, but it's just needing to happen. And what if we were to think about God is waiting for us to be the catalyst of change in somebody else's life. That instead of waiting for there to be this dynamic moment in a service where someone is an amazing orator and now all of a sudden they are now, you know, an MIT and moving into, no, 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 no. What if you invest in what you see and the gifts that you see in that person and help cultivate and be that so when they get to that stage, they have less obstacles to, to go through than you did. So, but I, I don't think that a lot of people have that approach. And I think some of that is just because, you know, even what they've been, you know, how they've been coached, you know, they've seen it go the other way or they they felt it or felt someone at their heels saying, I'm coming for your spot. And, you know, I think sometimes where we don't know how to take healthy competition and translate it into other spaces where, you know, as Zelda said, like, you know, we're pushing, we're leaning in together. I'm taking that correction. I'm doing that. Oh, she corrected me in an email. She pointed out that I misspelled something. She clarify the scripture that I thought I was referencing. She must have it in for me. And so now I'm going to wall off and not communicate with anybody. I'm not going to lead anybody. I don't want to mentor anybody. I'm not going to do anything other than what God told me to do. And then you miss God's voice telling you, actually, I needed you to shift. Listen, y'all have so much to say. You're all a deep, you're all just <laughs> wells, just bubbling to the top. And we, I wish we had a whole lot more time. We do have a little more time, but I just love to just hear all of you, but we're gonna keep it moving. Um, uh, Jesus is the answer, not to the church. Jesus is the answer to the world. 
church is supposed to be the platform by which he presents this answer to the world. So therefore, if the church is to be that which presents truth and spiritual truth, then, then certainly the church should own that truth, right? And so there should be, in spite of the conditions and the circumstances around us, and in spite of the natural responses, we talk about a supernatural experience with God that informs my emotion, informs my intellect, informs my my uh, my physical approach to dealing with the same thing that the world deals with. But yet, from the platform of the church and from this intimate relationship with God, there's an expectation that comes along with that. Right. So uh, the world is going to change. It's going to see transformation. The church should be leading that charge. So, with that in mind, as people of color and in your different professions. Has there been, and I know there has, a difference in your interaction with those who are not people of color? And so there has been a difference in your interactions. And the question is, as all of you are mature believers, you know, we got preachers here, we got administrators here, we got uh, uh, evangelists here. So all of you are that. So tell me the pressure you have had in balancing that call but not punking out in terms of the real issues that are affecting and impacting the people that even by your color you represent. So who wants to start? I throw that out to you. <clears throat> who wants to grab that and begin? Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, so I do lead worship downtown at a, a shelter. Um, the name of the church is called Communitas and the pastor, um, most of the staff, most of the clergy, they are, they are white. Mm. And, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, we love when you come and sing songs and it's a beautiful thing. And just, oh my God, your voice, this and the third. And uh, I let them know up front, like, okay. Um, so they, they requested, now this, this kind of threw me off at first, but they requested a male black worship leader. <laughs> this is this, they said, they said, okay, the majority of our congregation are black males. And it is hard sometimes to connect because we don't know exactly what it is that they go through. We, we don't understand fully. You know, we get it, we see it, we come in, we work in the shelter, but we need somebody to, who can who can connect with them, you know? So it's not just I'm singing songs and doing, I'm actually sitting with these guys and I'm talking to them and, and really they're telling me their stories and this, that, and the third. So they're in support of that, love it, cool. When all of this stuff started happening, I did wonder, my first Black Lives Matter post, I said, okay, I know I'm gonna get a call from somebody saying something about something. And the first call that I got was, hey, we just want you to know that we stand with you and that we support you and that we are with you. We're all the way in Michigan right now because they moved because their folks were, were sick and they wanted to be with their family. But that was the first call I got from them. We stand with you and we support you. Now, we do have a lot of people who uh, are silent about the matter, but to get that call right there eased any pressure that I had. Any any pressure, any any feelings that you know. Okay, well, I don't know where they stand on this, but I have to do it anyway. Mm. This can't my my position as worship leader cannot be, okay, well, I don't know if they're going to approve of this. I didn't ask them permission. I just, you know, I said, okay, this needs to be said. And I can't wait and I can't sit around for them to okay it. I don't knowing, not knowing their stance on it. Um, that was the first phone call they've gotten that I've received from them. Um, hello. Uh, no, the pressure has um, really not been, you know, so dramatic, and and I'm I'm grateful for that. Thank you, thank you for that. Someone else, jump in. 
Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I am listening and I just automatically, like the words that just popped up into my head is just like how in almost every job that I've had, I've had to learn, even in grad school, when I think about it, if I'm honest, I had to learn the art of code switching, the art of what you want to call it being multicultural or whatever you want to call it as far as, you know, you have, there's a certain letter, a letter, amount of stress that you have to deal with as far as making sure that you don't offend or you don't say something that might be aggressive or assertive, too, too, assertive, too assertive, too aggressive. Um, I can speak about me being a man of color um, that you kind of have to be on your toes. Now, I always try to be my authentic self, but it weighs on you after a while. And I think that what's going on in the world today that this is just you know a, a, another another piece of that that you have to deal with. I, I'm fortunate enough and blessed to say that I do have believers at my school, and we talk about different things. And my school, I, I mean, I, I work in a public school in the Bronx, so it's a majority of black and brown faces. However, I have to say this: I am the only male of color in a position of authority. Mm. So that in itself just tells me that representation is key and it's very important. So I, I don't take that lightly. Um, and at the end of the day, I try to be kind to everyone, but I also do stand my ground on certain things. And I think that I'm respected for it. Um, and I have to admit that we had a meeting today, I believe it was today, no, it was yesterday. Um, it was a, a school-wide meeting and I was actually shocked to hear my principal say some of the things that she said in solidarity, um, because I understand that it's a it's a hot topic and people don't want to offend people. And we've tried to have a real conversation, but you can tell people was ambivalent to really talk and it may take some time. But the way I see it is that we have to model behavior. How can we act like everything's okay to what Pastor Zelda said um, and deal with these families who are hurting and we don't know, you know, some of them may not have, don't know where they're gonna get their next meal, the things of that nature, if we don't deal with our own stuff, our own biases, our own issues. So, I mean, I'm hopeful that we can do it, but it definitely is difficult. And for me, you know, I, I, you know, I could think of times in grad school um, where I was the only person, I went to a Jewish university. I was the only person of color, only male, only um, person there. And when we would talk about different topics, everyone would literally look at me like if I was the representative of the whole race. And it's like, I don't mind giving my opinion, but you know, I can't do that. That's just ridiculous. So I just think that we have to continue to just be our authentic selves and also put the onus on other people because it's okay for us to educate and to be patient, but you have to educate yourself. You have to do the research yourself. And I love, um, if you guys don't know about it, you can Google it. Um, if you ever heard of Jane Elliott and Jane Elliott was um, an educator who, who conducted a test, um, the blue eye, brown eye test to third graders in her hometown of Iowa, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And it was very interesting just showing how fast, showing number one, showing how um, racism is learned and how fast people can shift and adapt. So, you know, I think that we learned it, we can unlearn it. And that's what I wanted to say. Beautiful, thank you, thank you. Ladies, can I jump in? Um, so I'm gonna jump in on what you just said, um, Sean. I think that whole notion of authenticity um, I take this mantra with me, like everywhere I go in every arena, leaders lead. And I've been charged with being the principal of this school. And the school takes on the persona of the leader, if you will. Uh, just the way your household takes on the persona, your kids, your family, they take on your persona. And so I have a very diverse staff that works with me. But one thing they will tell you is that I'm very transparent. I'm very um, honest with them about who I am and about what we expect for the little brown and black 
babies that we uh, are caused to serve, are called to serve, as well as the families. And so when issues of race come up, we lean in and we address it, right? Because it may not be your experience, because even with our being a person of color, you come with your own biases. I'm privileged. Right. I can come home and I know that food is in the well, in no food in the refrigerator, but I got money to buy. It, right. But so I know that I can get food. Right. Or there's a certain way when a person of color, you know, may come in and may be experiencing something and we immediately look at them in a certain way. That's our own biases that we bring to the work, all of us. But it's very important for us to in my environment to speak the same language because we really are shaping a generation. And I really do believe that what we put into them is what we get out. And there may be a people that have pushed back on my leadership style. I think they are um, learning. I have a very high retention rate with staff that are on my team. And that says something, right? That people feel comfortable being themselves or, or people feel comfortable checking someone who may not speak to a child. Uh, appropriately. We believe that they're human beings and we should speak to them in very human and dignified ways because they're people. And so I think I, I would say, um, you know, I, one of my mentors, Dr. Amatosha said this to me years ago when I first stepped into this position that I just didn't think that I was adequate to fulfill because, you know, looking at the field, I'm one of the few African-American African American leaders, let alone female leaders. And uh, one of the things he said to me when I was, I wanted to quit. And uh, things were not going the way that I wanted it to go or I thought it should go, which would be right for family. He said, at the end of the day, God puts you in that position. God is your employer. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than doing what's convenient. Obedience it's your obedience and your allegiance is to God. And so that's why you have to remain prayerful and never get it twisted because you have a title and think that you're out there on your own. It's because of God who has us there. And I think that that should give us the courage to speak and start to uh, transform the environments and what the sphere of influence has given us. And so I walk into set an environment where people feel comfortable being transparent and being willing to accept feedback and be willing to grow because we are all lifelong learners if you're an educator. Leah, thank you. Leah. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Code switching, um, thanks for introducing the term, Sean, has been real. Um, I did it a lot more earlier in my career um, as I had more opportunities to lead. I probably did a little less. I started feeling more comfortable with who I am, um, understanding what my purpose was. Um, if you don't understand your purpose, um, it will cause you to continue to question who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. So dig into that work um, of identifying what your purpose is. And your purpose might be over for a season and then you move. So um, I used to uh, lead the Career Development Center within New York University. I launched the Career Center in Shanghai. And then a mentor of mine said, hey, I need you to come over here. And I remember kind of looking at it and saying, like, oh, what? <laughs> but I have all this over here. And he's like, come over here. <laughs> And recognizing that my purpose shifted. My purpose shifted in the institution where I was able to um, get credibility based on some of the deliverables that came out of my previous work that allowed me to walk into a room and people questioned me a little less, or they questioned me less publicly, right? So the questioning still probably happened, but it was a little less, so I was like, oh, okay, Leah has the floor. Oh, okay, so, you know, she's done some things, so we're gonna listen to her. And so I think that absolutely has, um, has happened with those different interactions, but I realize it doesn't do anyone any favors. And so um, I've had, you know, meetings before the meeting and then the meeting after the meeting and the text group during the meeting, you know, where I've been the only person of color, the only woman, the only woman who's a person of color in the space. And I would text, you know, that white ally and say, I'm not doing this today. <laughs> you need to show up on this one. I can't be the diversity lady every day. That you you need to do this. You need to do this work. This is this is what this looks like, and this is what you know relationship looks like for me. This is what allyship means to me. Is um, when and how you can show up in these spaces. Um, and I'm going to say it if I if it needs to be said, I will say it. But um, if you're going to ride with me, then you need you need to, to understand that who I am is going to be someone who's going to look for you to be able to speak truth to power as much as I can and have. 
Um, so I think there have been differences in my interactions um, with people. I feel less, it's tiring. It is exhausting to have to constantly think about how you're showing up. I remember getting dressed in the morning and being like looking at my calendar to see well, who am I going to be meeting with and what should I be wearing and what does this look like and how is my hair and what is my makeup and what am I doing after and how do I da, 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 like going through all of that. And it's exhausting before, before I even had a cup of coffee, I ran 15 decisions in my head. Um, and so you just have to think about, is that the life that you want to continue to live now? And I'm not dismissing it, right? So I think that there are some people who are saying, well, it's easy for you. You might've gotten promoted. That's not a reality for you anymore. This is my day to day. I still have to deal with this in my work. But I do believe in the power of seeking God's wisdom and where you need to be. His word says that we are to have life and have it abundantly. That's not abundant living in my book. And so how do I hold on to the promises of God and apply them specifically to where I am in my life to see the results that glorify him, right? Because I know if I'm tired and I'm not opening my Bible and because I'm, I'm so exhausted and I'm angry all the time and I'm being a different person and these fruits of the spirit, they know where to be seen, you know, so that, that, that can't be what God has for my life. So I'm gonna shift my prayer a little bit to say reveal that bring people, intervene um, in those ways because it's, it's not realistic and it's not fair. But I do want to acknowledge that a lot of folks are living that reality um, every day, multiple times a day. I think there's a common thread between all of your remarks is that it's about identity, it's about knowing the truth and the truth shall make you free. And the truth that, we, that makes us free, even as the scripture says, the weapon that is formed against you. It's not say there will be no weapon. It's not going to be any problem. No, there is a weapon and it's formed against you, but it shall it shall not prosper. And the tongue that rises up against you, he shall condemn. He's got your back. But to apply what he has for you, you have to know the truth and the truth that should set you free. So identity should be locked in, as you all brought out, into knowing your giftedness, knowing the blessed assurance that you have in Christ, and then proceeding and dealing with those issues and all we talk about real issues that you have to face and you will have to face it and we will have to face it but we do not face it alone and we do it uh like uh, as pastor seller was talking about this this confrontation being willing to 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 lean forward and that's key and so i thank you all for your responses we are just about out of time but i do want to try and get something more um uh there's a lot of questions which one do i deal with Pastor Zelda, I want you to prepare um, <laughs> yourself. No, no, not right now. That you will be um, ending all this with a call to action. So you can start getting yourself ready to do that in just a moment. Um, real quick, ladies, though, I want to ask you a question. Um, how do you feel? It's, it's, it's about, and it shouldn't be like one versus the other, one versus, but, but you got George Floyd, George Floyd, Floyd, but you have this young woman who will be turning 27 years old and and sister taylor is not with us and we're not really hearing her name do we do anything with that or do we say you know what we just want this to be dealt with are we seeing well the male is more important than female what what how, how do you feel about that what is your impression we're not hearing so much about Bri 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 brianna what what's going on with this how, how do you feel about that real quick short sure, because we got another okay, quick intersection racism sexism, right? Racism teaches us that there's scarcity and resources. We can only but do so much. People only have attention for one thing. We have to put the best thing forward. Wait, 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 wait. Video. Take, your time. take your time. This is too good. Go, <laughs> ready. Go ahead. Yeah, take my time. This, yeah. is <laughs> so this is sounding good. Go ahead. Okay. Right. So racism teaches us that there's scarcity and resources, which we know that is not biblically sound. But it teaches us that there's a short attention span in society. People don't care about us. The intersection of sexism teaches us that we cannot empathize with black women. We do not have many sympathetic black women figures. Mm -hmm. Think about your favorite movies, think about your, your books, think about there's an edge, they're strong, they're lippy, there's that questionable, what did she do? She must have bounced back, that must have been a thing. Uh, 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 uh. All of that compounds in this space that doesn't create enough space for us to have this full conversation. So it's not that people on an individual level don't care about Breonna Taylor. I think that they do. And as soon as they hear her name mentioned, you know, you hear the names of Rakia Boyd, you hear the names of Sandra Bland. But 
there's a there's a level that digs in, particularly into the, the, the black community when we hear the names of Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin, because when we look systemically at what has happened even within the civil rights movement, the role of women to advance and to support our black men, which is important and needed and needed to happen, but there is some aspect of erasure, right? So we don't talk about how it was Mahalia Jackson who was on the phone with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King building him back up. We don't talk about it with her that said, tell him about the dream, Martin, that allowed him to bear off the script to actually introduce that speech into our, mm -hmm. our, our reality, right? Because we take these things, Black Lives Matter founded by Black women, right? So all of this intersects in this way that I hope that we continue to uplift you know, names, but think about it less on an individual level or saying to someone, you don't say this name enough and think about the systems that created a condition that allow us to erase multiple voices in this conversation. Okay. Okay. Can I, can I allow that to be the, the, the yes. response from everybody? That was so thorough and, and, and I think reflects where we, we all been going. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Cause it allows us also to handle another question. Um, how does a panel real quick, how does a panel, view white privilege and the impact it has on society going forward. Um, I truly believe that uh, it's called privilege because it's something that somebody else does not have. Um, so when you say white privilege, uh, you know, and, and, and how certain opportunities are granted uh, to white people, uh, simply because of, you know, the color of their skin or, um, you know, who, who their parents are, maybe even, you know, or, or you know, uh, family history um, because of the benefits of being white or the lack thereof from being black. Um, I believe that when people say use your privilege or use your white privilege to help us in this uh in 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 this this fight right now i believe i believe the goal in saying use your privilege is to ultimately do away with it mm -hmm. because with a lack of privilege privilege comes a lack of equality mm -hmm. that's basically what that's saying so where we're in the fight and and i saw i saw a video of a um a protest and um what it said was what what somebody said in the video was white allies move to the front white allies move to the front the police won't attack you or they won't attack you to get to us with, with it, it, uh in some cases it wasn't true but for that to be an actual thing man you That's know right. so, I like your point because what you're saying, Chris, is that if we could say view your white privilege and use it to help, the very fact that you move forward in white privilege, of course, you, of course you say, wait a minute, why should that make any difference? Once you can acknowledge you have privilege, then half the battle is won because we get people to mobilize as you bring out, oh yeah, because we they won't hit us. Okay, isn't that the problem? The fact that they won't hit you, but they'll hit us, isn't that? Oh, oh, that's what racism's about. So that beautifully, you brought us right into that point. Somebody else want to jump in? And I got another question before Zelda comes with us, before us. Yes. Yeah, I definitely have to, please, I have to jump in because I need to take my glasses off for this one because oh, um, I'm, curious then. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm just listening and I have to be honest and Lord help me, but it's just like, it's really affecting me because I just think of, Emmett Till, I think of the mm. Central Park Five, I think of Amy Cooper and how this most recent incident, she weaponized her white privilege and how that is, is, is destructive for, for, for men of color. And I think that we have to have these difficult conversations once again. And like I mentioned earlier, as far as with Jane Elliott, is that it just can't be us as people of color talking about this. It has to be uh, white people talking about this Absolutely. and checking themselves. And I think that when that happens, and I can be honest and say that, and I think it was mentioned earlier, is that for some reason this feels different, what's going on right now, is because we have people from all over the world coming together and protesting and showing that they believe that what's going on isn't right. 
And I think that that is powerful. And I think that we really have to encourage that more and, and, and really support that more because a lot of people, I remember look, looking at a documentary for Jane Elliott, like she got a lot of heat from doing that experiment. Mm -hmm. She had people um, 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 threatening her children. She lost friends. I mean, she had a lot of heat. So, I mean, I just think about that, how we really have to continue to support each other, but we can't do it alone. We have to really unite and our white brothers and sisters, they have to step up. Mm. Ladies, anyone want to jump in real quick? No? You, I know you have it, but you say, well, time is running. So here's a question I want you to answer. As believers in God, how do you deal with your inner racism, if any? That's because that's a strong one. I don't want to leave that one on the table. Um, I'll jump in because I want to shock some of you guys that are out there and have this misconception of pastors, right? I struggle with this daily. I am from the South, right? And so um, is where I grew up is very black and white. So I'm very cognizant of my blackness, uh, more so than I am even of my, well, New York has taught me to be very con cognizant of my gender, but I'm very cognizant of my blackness and I'm very cognizant of whiteness around me. And you know, I'll be honest with you, sometimes this is a dangerous place to live because down south, we know who the races are. They're very upfront about it. Uh, up here, they'll sit down with at dinner with you, right? And they'll sit down in school with you or whatever they may be. And so as a believer, how do I deal with it? I pray that God would take this hardness of hard um, sometimes that I feel. Um, I'll be honest with you, when I can say that I'm not okay, that seeing the George Floyd, having to watch that over and over, you know, I was inundated with it. And then having to see Miss Amy Cooper in privilege over and over, like I'm used to using, I'm used to seeing, you know, white people use their privilege to get what they want. And so I struggle with it. And I just pray it's one of those areas when you say, you know, who needs to be healed? I don't need to tell all y'all while I'm at the altar that I need to be healed. But somebody, that's why he probably didn't take me off this week and I need to ask the Lord for healing and control my thoughts. And, and so I just want to be in real in my transparency with you. Yes, I'm a leader. And that is an area that I struggle with and continue to seek God's um, seek God's face about my issues uh, regarding racism. Amen. Amen. Yes. Someone else want to jump in? I mean, I would think um, I also got, I, you know, educated on me. I got, I got to reframe the inner racism to think about, you know, just reminding folks that racism is um, a structure, right? So it's, it's, it's power and discrimination being able, you know, to, to work and align together. But I think that we do have our bias. I think we might have stereotypes. I think there might be things that we take into account when we're interacting with people. Um, that I think we continue to work on. You you acknowledge it, you check it, you name it, and you you know interrogate where that came from. So um, whether and I think we have to think um, also beyond some of the biases, and I think especially within our communities, so if we're talking about a community predominantly of people of color, what does our our bias look like to people with abilities, with disabilities, mm -hmm. right? And so you know what does this look like for people who think differently, right? Who might be on an autism spectrum? Like how do we account and allow for those folks to to show up? But it's naming that, right? It's naming, uh, you know, a little bit about what's happening and looking at it. But now here's the thing: wrong is wrong. So, <laughs> Amy Cooper, I, you know, this, the the thoughts being expressed are those of Leah Lattimore, are not necessarily a Buffalo Gospel Assembly. And she lost her job, and that's an absolute consequence. I bet she won't do it again, right? And so there still needs to be accountability, and so we can still have love for people, but then also say that, you know what, you know, as we learn that there are consequences. Um, to certain actions. So, you know, I think that there's that that moment that we 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 name it, we interrogate it, we address it, we course correct, but then we also sometimes have to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, we can move forward then. And uh, the last thing we'll say, the question is, what is one practical step someone can take to make a difference? So the question comes out of how can we work towards changing this general reality? that our brothers and sisters are facing and dealing with and what is the practical step someone can take to make a difference? Um, I believe we spoke about that before um, and that is uh, being totally authentic with how you feel um, about every situation. 
Um, I believe if you are, if in your heart you are, you know, racist or biased or you have certain feelings towards black people or white people, I think you need to be very vocal. Now is not the time to be silent on these things. I think if we're very authentic, as somebody somebody in the panel said before, if we're very authentic and very vocal about how we feel, um, not more so in an in an anger or, or, you know, a lot of us are upset. A lot of us are angry. Um, but if we can actually sit down and, and get to the bottom of why is it that we feel this way? Mm -hmm. What have you seen? What have you experienced? What have you learned that has caused you to feel the way that you felt? Is it history? Is it uh, the lack of history? What haven't you seen? You, you never know uh, what you can learn by actually opening up the conversation. Now there are been, there have been times when people on on social media because you know I'm I'm coming across a lot of people who when I say black lives matter um, their thought process is that I'm saying that black lives are superior to everybody else. And it's not that we want to be superior, it's that we want to be equal. So I think that and opening that conversation even clarified a lot for unexpectedly for a lot of people who didn't see the purpose in this movement, who didn't see uh, the purpose in why we say Black Lives Matter or why I stopped doing uh, Denzel videos for a while. Oh, you got to keep the content coming because you know you're you're this person and you're that person. I think this is a time to be very vocal about everything that's going on. So if we were more vocal about exactly how we feel exactly how we feel and why we feel this way, I think we could actually uh, actually move forward. My answer would just simply be to read, read, read. There are many books out there, read. Okay, read. Um, I will say that we really need to be mindful of where we're spending our money. And I think, you know, we have to look at cooperative economics and not just look at it as just one day at a Kwanzaa a year, that we really have to, you know, think about our economic power and we have power and I don't think we use it like we should. And I've always was taught that if I go into a store and I don't feel comfortable, like if someone's, you know, racial profiling and they looking at me and, and I don't feel comfortable, like they really, um, want my business, I'll leave. I don't care what store, I, I could, it can, I can be thirsty and they have the only glass of water, I will leave. Because at the end of the day, um, you shouldn't support people who don't, who don't respect you. So I think that that's something that we really need to focus on and unite to make sure that we spend our money where we need to be to better our communities and to also make them respect us. And Leah. I will say, I'm going to make it quick. I will say, um, been having this conversation with folks a lot. I think that we have to invest in each other and recognizing that our liberation is tied up in each other's and it requires solidarity. So if we are looking into what the future could be for our kids, for these babies, for ourselves, I can't do it in opposition to my brother. We have to do it together. So we know that the prison industrial complex is running rampant within our community. I will encourage everyone to read. There was a 2015 report that talked about the sexual abuse to prison pipeline for our girls. So we know about the school to prison pipeline for our boys and how they are over disciplined and um, in, in, in different ways and excluded from things in communities. And we're finding that our girls are on that same trajectory and could outnumber our men in prison, but they're showing up in the space because the way that they the way that they experience trauma and sexual abuse has them being you know mouthy in class, and so we're now seeing them tracked into disciplinary actions that are tracking them right into the pipeline. So hey, let's come together as a community and talk about why this system is still allowed to ravage our community and what we're going to do about it. It might require different things: how we work with our girls, how we work with our boys. But we need to come together because there's no society that I want to be in where I'm free and my brother's not. Mm -hmm incredible responses from each and every one of you. And, and, and again, we could build a whole discussion around any of these questions and just really delve into it. And for those who listen, we trust that you got the gist and the direction. These four individuals were not coached, but 
the spirit of God, what we have in common is the spirit of God and understanding who we are and humility that goes with it. Thank you for your um, transparency, Pastor Zelda. And, um, and, and I think that everyone should appreciate the level to which each spoke from their heart um, because they're secure in who they are in Christ Jesus. And so on that note, I'm gonna ask our Pastor Zelda to give us a word in closing. So please do not sign off, stay on and get this. <laughs> I think Leah gave a word. You should have you should tag that. Our liberation is tied in each other. That is powerful. So thank you for sharing that. But before you go, I'll remind us of the prophet Habakkuk. In the first chapter, Habakkuk's crying out and he's crying out to the Lord. And he said, How long, God, do we have to experience this? How long? And then I'm not gonna preach, but in the second chapter, God actually responds to Habakkuk and he gives them an answer. And he tells them, write the vision and make it plain, plain so that men could run with it. And it is critical in this day and age, especially given the climate that we're living in, that we do not become another hashtag, that we don't just let this movement pass by us, but we really have written a vision and, and so many of our ancestors, the shoulders we stand on, they've written it for us. It's up to this generation to do the work now. And so what does the work look like? It really looks like us getting up because you, we all have to understand that Jesus is an advocate for justice. And as Paul said, we're called to be imitators of him. And in order to do that, we cannot be silent anymore. So you need to stand up, speak up, and be heard. And when, uh, in order for us to do that, June 23rd is coming for New York City. Every single person that is eligible should make themselves eligible to vote and should get a vote. Will that solve everything? No, but it doesn't stop there because we're not waiting for another leader per se, when God has called us to be the leaders. You're asking, who's it going to be? As Habakkuk asks God, well, who, you know, I, who is it? Can't you just do it? And God is saying, you're the answer. You're the answer to the prayer that you just prayed. We are the answers as a collective body to the prayers that we're praying. So that means that we need to be doing, making sure that we fill out the census. Have you filled out the census? Yes. You need I, to be counted. Yeah. So everybody needs to fill out the census. Everybody needs to be a registered voter that is eligible to a voter to vote. We need to vote and we need to not let this conversation end on this social media platform, but with our friends, we're having a conversation. And then the next question we're asking is, what can we do? Brother Sean brought up one issue or one thing that we can do. The first step is monitor where your money is going. This, com this country is governed by economics. So understand where are you investing your money? Then secondly, where are you investing your time? Our children need you. We, they need you as advocacies to advocate to the legislators to make sure they get equitable education. So it's very, very important that we be the answer to our prayer, that we not only write this vision or run with the vision that so many answers have left, left with, but we be the answer to the prayer. And so my prayer is that you won't have to leave this Facebook live page or this, this time that we've had together, but you will say to the Lord, Father, show me the way in which I can make an impact in my generation. Show me the way in which I can make an impact in my society. Show me the way in which you'd like to use me to be the difference maker. And every single one of you have the ability to make change. The first step is to vote, vote. People die for us to have the opportunity to vote. So now let's move from just talking and marching out on the street all that is great, but we need to be in boardrooms. We need to use every sphere of influence that the Lord has given us to be a voice and come with a vision that God has given you for humanity, for humanity. So my prayer is that you would go with God in all of your steps today, knowing that he will guide you if you commit your work. Amen. 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 We want to thank all of you. Thank you for that word, Pastor Zelda. Again, I want to thank you, Sean White, uh, Chris King, uh, Leah Lattimore, and of course, our Pastor Zelda Washington for just being here tonight and speaking so eloquently and speaking so transparently. And to all of you who have been on this line, we're sorry we did not get to your question, but guess what? You can put your questions in the comment space that's provided, and we will be answering them all week long. So please do that. And we also want to remind everyone that uh, there is prayer um, continues at Bethel Monday, 
Wednesday, I'm sorry, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 6 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 3 p.m., and 7 p.m. And of course, on Wednesday, we have this session that will be streamed live. The others will be on the uh, free um, conference call line. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, we have prayer at 6 a.m., 11 a.m., and 3 p.m. And also on those days, we have our Bible study. It's already started. And those classes are, are on Tuesday and Thursday evening. So you can be a part of that. But certainly at 7 o'clock on the other days, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we have prayer at 7. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, to seeing more of you. Uh, the Heart Matters continues. And so we'll be dealing with issues that will help us to keep um, uh, the conversation going, but not just to be talking about it, but to come into a place to be about it. Remember, humility is important. Humility informs your integrity. Integrity will help you to come into a loving relationship with God. And out of that loving relationship with God, as it increases, you come into liberation. And your liberation is not just for you, it's for others, and it should be sustained. The Hills Principle. Humility, integrity, love, liberation, and sustainability. And so we're looking for all of us to be what God has called us to be, even in this time when the people are looking for leadership and the best leadership they can find is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us be about his business. Bless us, Lord, as we go. Continue to uh, anoint us and a special blessing upon all those who participated in the program tonight. And Lord, may your will be done in and through our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. God bless you. To all of you,